Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. Um, I'm talking with you from Austin, Texas, and um, you may see some Basinjis roaming around here in a little bit, the, my two dogs are, that, that are with me here. Anyhow, um, I'm glad to see many new names on my message board tonight, and so for the new people here, welcome. And I'm also pleased to see that we have a number of uh, returning people as well, too, and that you are getting some value out of this. So I, I'm, I'm very glad to be helping you and, and, and enjoy doing that. Uh, in terms of the way you can participate in these webinars, there's actually a couple ways. Number one, uh, you can be very bold and write a question to me. Um, the way you do that, if you're new here is on, or anyone, but especially if you're new, you use the chat box function at the bottom on the right-hand side of the screen and um, write your question to me there. Shorter questions work better for this format. If the questions just get too long, I won't even post them. Okay, so just keep that in mind. I, I, the ones that get heavily involved into your detailed history just don't work well here uh, because I don't get to do a give and take with you. Um, and then um, if you, the other way to participate is uh, listen to the questions as I read them. And if you're in the live version, you'll actually see them posted on your screen too. So, um, and see what responses I give. And uh, as you'll see, I sometimes use a question as a means of explaining a lot of different things and I can go off on tangents sometimes, but usually for, for a good reason. I, they're, they're not for uh, bad reasons at all. Um, I am recording tonight's webinar and uh, tomorrow morning you'll get a email from me announcing that the recording is ready to be seen. Uh, and that um, it will also include in that email information um, about how to sign up for the next series of webinars. Uh, we will be off next week. I'm not going to be hosting a webinar next week, but then I'll have um, three of those in the month of May that we'll wind up doing a beginning about two weeks from now. So uh, keep that in mind. You can sign up tomorrow. We'll, we'll announce that tomorrow in that email that comes out as well too. Um, in the email will be a synopsis of what we talked about tonight. Um, so it gives you some idea um what it was and you can kind of use that as a means of kind of flipping through the video to find the area that you want um i know i periodically get asked if i would have somebody do timestamps and uh to the summary and the trouble is it's just me <laughs> i don't have an extensive number of staff helping me with this it's me so um, i don't have time to do that um so using the summary though you should be able to kind of use that as a guide to work through uh the, the video recording all right so without any further ado, let's go ahead and get started here. Go ahead and take and post the first question here. Hello, John. Let's see, while on cholesterol for mold toxicity, what do you recommend to help with constipation? I'm having a difficult time. Ah. So um, cholesterol is a uh, medication, many of you may be familiar with that is historically been used to bind cholesterol in the intestines. Uh, mold toxins that get trapped in you as part of their process will get moved into the liver um, in a fat soluble form and then they eventually get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream and so you just get this circulating loop of mold toxins but we can use fat binders like cholesterol to pull them out okay so that's why john's using the cholesterol one of the drawbacks to cholesterol is it is constipating in a number of people um, and so for that reason, I tend to prefer not using it as my first line uh, binder. I tend to like using something called um, a GI detox uh, by um, Biocide and Botanicals or something called Mycopole by Research and Nutritionals. Those are herbal compounds that have a variety of things in them that tend not to lead to constipation. Okay. But if you are using cholesterol, there are some things you can do to help with that constipation. So number one, I like to have people take magnesium um, and you can do it before bedtime. Uh, magnesium citrate, magnesium sulfate. Uh, those would be the ones I would tend to use. And you can take um, around 400, 600 milligrams. And if that hasn't, um, and the reason to take it at bedtime is that amount is probably going to make you a little bit sleepy. Okay. Magnesium helps hold more water in the intestines and make things mushier. Right. So that's a first line of defense. If that doesn't work well enough, then I'll have people add um, vitamin C to that. And the amount of vitamin C that a person can handle is, uh, orally usually is dictated by what the gut is going to allow. So if you put enough vitamin C in orally, eventually you're going to get some loose stools. 
And that can happen somewhere around 4,000 to 6,000 milligrams. So you can buy buffered vitamin C tablets that are about 1,000 milligrams, and you could do anywhere from four to 10 of those, but find what your tolerance is. So start at four. If that doesn't work after one night, then go up to five and you know just work your way up until uh, you can figure out which, um, which amount of vitamin C coupled with taking magnesium loosens your stools, okay? Another thing that um, trick that you might look at is there is a uh, over-the-counter medication called Miralax, which is a, um, for lack of a better way of saying, it's plasticized fiber. <laughs> so it's fake fiber, but, and so it doesn't get absorbed, but it can stimulate uh, water holding in the intestines and it can get your intestine muscles to contract to help push things through. And sometimes I'll add that in as well too, okay? But ultimately, some people just can't do cholesterol. It's just too constipating, even with all those measures, in which case um, you might look at doing a mycopol or you might look at doing a GI detox. And those herbs, um, you would wind up doing roughly a scoop of cholesterol is going to be equal to about two of those pills, basically. Yeah, so just that kind, that's kind of the general uh, way that I wind up dosing those as well, too. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, John. Thanks for that question. Hello, Carter. Any suggestions to gain weight? I have turned into a skeleton with skin on top. Is that hyperthyroid? So um, it's interesting. I, so first of all, I, I don't know why you're not gaining weight. And that should be something that you want to have your physician evaluate you for. So one of the things that they're going to want to do is look into what your thyroid function is. Um, they're going to want to take a history about why you're not gaining weight. So for instance, for some people, it's because they fill up easily because their stomach isn't emptying things into the intestines. In that case, they have to do some x-rays and to evaluate whether that's a problem. Um, in an extreme case, people will get colon cancer and that can kill your appetite as well too. I'm not saying you have colon cancer, but what I am trying to say is this is something that you ought to see a primary care doctor. It doesn't have to be a specialist, somebody that you can, at least they can go through the basic steps of figuring out uh, why it is that you're not gaining weight. Okay. So that's one thing I would recommend. Um, but that's the main thing I would recommend. Um, so uh, take a look at that. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, Carter. Hello, Bob. Hello, Dr. Ross. Let's see. I have successfully treated and removed mold from my system confirmed via real times and have been on your recommended herbal supplement to get rid of yeast for two months. I still feel fatigued with some sleep disturbances. Do you think I still have yeast or can it be something else? Since there is no test for yeast, trying to figure out what my next plan of action should be. Any thoughts, ideas would be appreciated. Thanks. All right. So, um, So if you are still fatigued, there's some things to think about, okay? So number one, um, it, there is a possibility yeast is still there. And so the questions I'll look at, symptoms I'll look at that help me understand whether that's possible is, uh, do you have increased sugar cravings uh, relative to before you got sick, for instance, okay? Um, something else to consider is, um, do you have a lot of intestinal gassiness or bloating? Um, and then uh, finally, you also have to consider um, whether there's any changes to your skin. So intestinal yeast overgrowth release toxins that can sometimes lead to a lot of pimples and acne, sometimes skin rashes like eczema. Um, so you want to get, you know, have those things considered um, as well, too. OK. All right. Now, if you decide based on symptoms and talk to your physician, I mean, they should be able to help you to figure this out, too. If it looks like yeast is not there and you are still having significant fatigue, um, then there's some other things to consider. Number one, um, if you are very fatigued, they should do basic evaluation. I mean, they should look at your, um, your basic metabolic profile, which looks at kidney liver function. They should do blood counts. They should do an, uh, and, and thyroid studies. Just make sure that metabolically and hormonally, 
you don't have a cause for that uh, decreased energy. But one of the main reasons that um, people have um, uh, a lot of fatigue, and I think that, yeah, that's what you said. So one of the things that can happen with multoxicity is those toxins can injure your energy factories called mitochondria. So every one of our cell energy factories uh, or cell cells has an energy factory system made up of 300 to 400 mitochondria, okay? So these are little microprocessors in your cells. And what happens on the inside of a mitochondria is sugar and fat are converted through a bunch of chemical reactions to create a type of cell fuel called ATP, okay? And what happens in multoxicity, what can happen in chronic Lyme is that you get injury to the covering of the mitochondria. And if that covering gets injured, it's very difficult for the mitochondria to correctly absorb fat and sugar to the inside to be burned into cell fuel. And then secondly, um, uh, that healthy covering is needed to release uh, electrons into some of those chemical reactions that create cell fuel as well too. Okay, so th those processes don't happen correctly. So um, the mitochondria membrane is made up of a double layer of fat or a double layer of what we call phospholipids. Phospholipids are fat. So you can repair that. And uh, one of the things, a product that does a good job doing that, and there's some science behind it that shows it does do repair to the mitochondria and you get better energy, you get better thinking, um, is uh, to use a product called ATP360 uh, by Research Nutritionals. It's a supplement that has uh, a number of phospholipid complexes and a number of types of phospholipid complexes. And in addition, it's got some micronutrients in it that are designed to help your mitochondria work better. A starting dose for that is three pills, one time a day. Um, usually I tell people to give it a minimum of two months to see if it's gonna make a difference for you or not. If you're starting to feel more energy over those two months, then use it for an additional four months to get complete repair basically, okay? Now, there's one little nuance here. If you are a person that also has Babesia, and Babesia can get a lot of fatigue too, um, and you're treating Babesia, and I don't think you are, but I'm, this is for other people. If you're treating Babesia um, and you're on a medicine called a Tovoquone, Malarone, which also has a Tovoquone in it, or Mepron, which is all a Tovoquone, you don't want to mix coenzyme Q10 with that. And the difficulty is, is that the ATP 360 has some CoQ10 in it. So in that case, the way to repair your phospholipids is use a different product from Research Nutritionals, which is called NT Factor. And that has a mix of phospholipids in it, but doesn't have any of that coenzyme Q10 in it, okay? And so the way you use the NT Factor is two pills three times a day. You do that for at least two months. If you're feeling better, but you're not all the way back, then continue it, but you can drop the dose after the first two months down to one pill three times a day, okay? So those are two things I'll do, okay? And in addition, for mitochondria dysfunction, think of the uh, NT factor and the ATP 360 as fixing the mitochondria from the outside. You also wanna work from the inside of the mitochondria to repair damage as well too. And what does that quite well is an um, antioxidant uh, called um, glutathione, right? So many of you may be familiar with glutathione. It's the main detox chemical made by the liver. Um, and, but it has a number of functions. Um, it's a very strong antioxidant and its main job is to help cells detox and repair injury basically, okay? So the problem with a, a glutathione is orally, it's not that well absorbed unless it's prepared to be absorbed. And what helps get it absorbed are what are known as liposomal products, okay? So a good a liposomal um, glutathione product is uh, made by research nutritionals also. And that's a product called Prifortify. And I like to have people take a teaspoon um, one time a day of that as well too, okay? All right, so let me just do a quick screen share here. I wanna give you some, show you some resources here. All right, so let's see here. All right. So um, this is Treat Lyme by Marty Ross, MD, okay? I hope you can see this. Um, I think you're seeing it, but anyhow, 
Um, if you go to the online line guide here and look under the section called energy and fatigue, you'll find my article here called how to fix mitochondria and get energy and Lyme disease. Okay. That one gives you details about the things I was just talking about. All right. Second article for those of you that are interested in mold toxicity, a little bit more about what this problem is. Take a look in my detoxification section here. And there's an article called Mold and Lyme Toxin Illness. And this is where I talk about the problem with mold toxins and the various binders that you can use, okay? And then finally, in terms of the products that you can use, um, the products I was mentioning are both made by Research Nutritional. So I'm at my supplement store site right now, uh, Marty Ross MD Supplements. If you look under the Research Nutritionals tab, and you're going to see that the, I want to point out something. They actually have a product called ATP 360. I'm circling it here. And another one called ATP Fuel. I want you to do the ATP 360. It's a newer product and better formulated than the old product called ATP Fuel. Okay. And then also in terms of the, um, the, uh, the glutathione product that they have, this, this Trifortify Orange or the Trifortify Watermelon there too, okay? And then just a word, um, this uh, Marty Ross MD supplements I originally designed for my patients. <laughs> so this, these are the products that I have used with my patients over the years and I find very helpful, but anyone can use this site. So if you're looking to see what do I, products do I recommend, um, keep in mind I've curated these products to take the guessing game out of it. There's a lot of garbage supplements out there, but I have found good quality ones and. You can look here to see what do I carry, but also you can buy from me. Um, the advantage to buying from me is I uh, pay your local and state sales taxes. And the other advantage is um, I will pay for your shipping as long as your orders are over $50. Okay. In terms of pricing of the products, I sell at the lowest amount allowed by the manufacturers. Okay. So anyhow, I just wanted to point that out to you as well too. All right. So let's go back here. All right. Thanks for your question, Bob. Good luck to you. Hello, Beth. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Your weekly Q&A sessions are a true grit. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're getting some benefit out of it. Um, thank you. Got a few questions this week. Number one, my son has been doing really well for several months now. He's been on Cat's Claw, Otobobar, Japanese knotweed, simon clove oregano, and lubrokinase for almost a year. Then about three weeks ago, he had an emergence of symptoms that seem like Bartonella or maybe Babesia with brain fog, buzzing, uh, joint pain, stabbing nerve pains, air hunger, and heart palpitations. Two, is it typical for Bartonella Babesia to resurface like this? Three, to cover this and still make sure we are hitting the line, would we shift to cryptolepis, Japanese knotweed, cinnamon clove oregano, and lover kinase? Would that hit all three, Lyme, Bart, and Babesia in all their forms? Is it okay to switch out natokinase for lover kinase? Okay, so a lot of questions there, but I'll try to cover them for you, all right? So the one thing that I just wanna make you aware of, um, in my experience, um, in about 80 to 90% of the time, that somebody's doing a lot better and then they get into a big decline, like you're describing here, it's due to intestinal yeast overgrowth. And you're probably thinking, well, what the heck does that have to do with this? Well, um, keep in mind when you have Lyme disease and infections of Bartonella or Babesia, some of the main reasons you feel poorly is that your immune system in trying to get rid of those infections overproduces a group of inflammatory chemicals called cytokines, okay? Now, cytokines are good and bad, all right? On the good side, they turn the immune system on. But on the downside is if the immune system isn't doing a good job, it's going to keep trying harder and harder, and eventually it makes too many cytokines, all right? So symptoms of too many cytokines are what Lyme, Bartonella, and Babesia look like, all right? So um, what I have found in my practice is about 80 to 90% of the time, if I start looking for yeast overgrowth in these situations, that's what will identify as the problem, all right? So things that make you wonder about yeast overgrowth in your son would be um, increased sugar cravings, 
uh, increased intestinal gassiness or bloating, um, uh, changes in the skin with more rashes and possibly eczematous type rashes and or even pimples and acne, okay? Yeast release toxins that interact with the skin and give those kind of conditions, okay? So in my experience, about 80 to 90% of the time you get a decline like this, you'll find yeast if you start looking for it, okay? If it is yeast, um, often you can handle the yeast without having to stop the herbal antibiotics. And um, you can approach yeast either by going prescription options, which would be a combination of diflucan and nystatin. Um, and that could even take up, I would do that for 30 days. Um, or you could look at an herbal compound like a Capri Plus or a Phytostan. And those, um, you would wind up doing two pills twice a day. And that might take up to two months, actually. Okay. All right. Now, in terms of, um, so I just wanted to give you that as an overview, but then let me handle them directly, these questions as you listed them here. Um, so in terms of your second question, um, you know, is it typical for Bartonella obesity to resurface like this? Uh, not necessarily. Um, again, that's why I start looking for yeast. But um, but uh, peeling lime is like peeling the layers of an onion. Okay, so as you get through some layers, what's underneath becomes more apparent. So I have seen this happen before. Okay, but it's not common that it happens to this degree. All right. Um, third question you had was um, if you if this is a resurgence of a Bartonella babesia, could you shift to Cryptolepis? And so, yeah, so, you know, to, to those that are aware of this, Cryptolepis is an herb that is effective against babesia, but also based on laboratory studies that came out of Johns Hopkins University about a year ago now, um, we now know that it can treat growing and persister Lyme and growing and persister Bartonella. And so I've been using it in my treatments and finding quite a bit of success using it as a Bartonella agent and using it as a Lyme agent as well too, okay? Now keep in mind your Japanese knotweed and the cinnamon clove oregano also are very effective at growing in persister Lyme and Bartonella as well too, okay? So you could easily do a combination that's Cryptolepis, Japanese knotweed, and the cinnamon clove oregano and the lumber kinase, okay? Now, the reason um, Beth, everyone, the reason that Beth is using the lumber kinase uh, with her um, with her son is that a uh, lumber kinase is useful at breaking up what are known as fibrin nest. So Babesia and Bartonella have the ability um, to blend themselves and bind themselves to the blood clotting protein floating around your blood called fibrin. And they form these fibrin germ nests and they stick themselves on the lining of your blood vessels and they're hard for the immune system to get through and they're also hard to get antibiotics through all right so lumber kinase can break that down in terms of um, natokinase natokinase i think is almost 300 times weaker i mean it is degrees of weakness less effective than lumber kinase is okay so i i, I usually have my patients stay with the lumber kinase, okay? And then, um, yeah, I think I think I just covered that for you. All right, so yeah, um, all right, good luck to you. Thanks for your question. Hello, L. Dear Dr. Ross, I have chronic Lyme and Babesia, other co-infections that I have more or less under control. Since this winter, after a viral infection, I have asthma and should be treated with cortisone. What should be done to prevent Lyme and co-infections from reactivating since cortisone is immunosuppressive? Thanks a lot. Hmm. Um, Okay, so I, I just want to throw this out. <laughs> I don't want to sound like Dr. Yeast here tonight, but I'm going to act like I'm Dr. Yeast here tonight. So um, no, yeast is not the cause of everything, but um, it could be here with you. So one thing about intestinal yeast overgrowth, again, being on herbal or prescription antibiotics, you're set up to get too many yeast in the intestines, okay? And 
viral infections, especially if it was a GI viral infection, could have even altered the good bacteria in your microbiome, leaving a greater chance for yeast to grow. Okay, so why am I thinking yeast here? Well, you, your asthma. Um, so if you have intestinal yeast overgrowth in some people, that really activates uh, one of the cells that lines the intestines called mast cells. And mast cells are your allergy cells, they're where histamines are made. If they get activated by the yeast, the histamines that are being released on the intestines get into the bloodstream, go up to your nose and into your lungs up in the nose. They can trigger a lot of nasal congestion, runny noses, but it, and they can also trigger a lot of asthma. Okay, so as an example, I had a patient a number of years ago that had a history of chronic asthma, was on inhalers, multiple kinds of inhalers, and um, really did not have the best control. I determined as part of get, getting ready to treat her uh, Lyme and co-infections that I thought she was just full of yeast in her intestines as well too. It took two months, we cleared out her yeast using a diflucan nystatin combination, and, um, and, then, and then her asthma went away. We never had more problems with asthma at all during the rest of her treatment. And so for her, it had been asthma as an underlying, uh, the underlying cause of the asthma had been intestinal yeast overgrowth triggering mast cell activation or, or activating the mast cells too much, okay? So I, I would just, I if you were my patient, I would be trying to question you to say, are there too many yeast? Um, because um, cortisol is not a good way to go. Uh, it, and, and I would try to avoid cortisol, but I'm not your physician. I don't know how bad your asthma is, but you're, you are correct in being concerned about cortisol leading to immune suppression that could allow Lyme to grow too much, okay? So I would want to see if there's an, another underlying cause like the yeast that I just talked about. Um, the other thing is uh, instead of using steroids, they might look at other options like um, using your inhalers along with Singulair. Singulair can get... Uh, a lot of the inflammation from asthma under control. But, you know, if you've got to use steroids, sometimes you just have to do it too, but it's not ideal here, okay? All right. Um, so in terms of determining if you have yeast and then what to do about yeast, I'm going to just do a quick screen share here for you and show you an article. All right. So let's see here. All right, so this is um, uh, my supplement story. Again, let me get over to the information site. So this is my, my information site, Treat Line by Marty Ross, MD, again. Take a look in my section over here called Yeast. And in here is an article called A Silent Problem, Is It Yeast? This will give you information and to help you and your physician determine do you have too many yeast in your intestines, okay? And then in terms of if you have too many yeast, here is my guide on both herbal and prescription ways to manage the illness that I have found helpful. Okay, all right. All right, thanks all for that question. Good luck to you. Hello, Thomas. Let's see, what focuses on the neck with cracking and frozen shoulder? So the cracking and popping is often a symptom of Lyme infection. Okay, why it happens, I don't know, but that often is a symptom we associate with Lyme. Uh, frozen shoulder may or may not be Lyme related. It could be due to inflammation in that area. Uh, some of the things I find helpful for frozen shoulders, again, treat your infections, but also acupuncture sometimes can be quite useful, physical therapy and acupuncture. Acupuncture can get some good releases and frozen shoulders at times, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Thomas. Hello, Lynn, let's see how Dr. Ross. I know you use lumber kinase to break up fiber nest and lime, or is it Bartonella? It's Bartonella and Babesia too. And I'm wondering about using it for long COVID since microclots in the blood are being postulated as one of the causes perpetuating factors in long COVID. And some doctors are using heavy duty clotting meds to treat it. Would lumbar kinase or nanokinase be um, good to try for treating long COVID? 
If so, which one would you lean toward and which dose? Are there other natural products you might try to work with? Uh, this microclot theory of long COVID. One practitioner recommends artichoke leaf expect, extract to help with thrombosis. Any thoughts? So I'm not familiar with the artichoke uh, leaf. I, I can't make a comment on that. Um, I know there is, you know, it, it, to be honest with you, we're still trying to understand what long COVID is, and it might be a lot of things and different people, right? There is a theory that some in some people it is due to microclots that were triggered by COVID. Um, I think it's a valid theory. I don't, I don't know if it applies to everyone. Um, and so there are some people working with uh, clot busters and uh, uh, heparin and uh, um, uh, other other ways of breaking it up. The, the natural way that we have that can break up the fibrin that makes up part of the clots. And again, these clots are made up of platelets and the, the, the fiber uh, bound together. Okay, but we can break down, at least we can break down the fibrin component, and my my product I would use for that would be lower kinase. It's much stronger than what a natokinase is. A general dose I would use is 20 milligrams twice a day. I haven't looked at the literature of what people are finding successful in the COVID world, though, and so it's possible they may even want to go up to 40 uh, milligrams or even 60 milligrams twice a day. Um, these are things you should talk over with your physician to see what they think is going to be best for you, though. OK, again, I know I give you all advice here, but I'm not your physician. I don't know the ins and outs of everything. OK, so the things I raise with you are things for you to consider, preferably with a physician. OK, all right. But yeah, I, lumbar kinase might give you some benefit here. OK, all right. Good luck to you, Lynn. Hello, TJ. What causes loss of body hair, but not hair on top of the head? You know, I always start by looking at um, thyroid and iron levels. Um, now, granted, you would think if you have loss of body hair, you should you probably would start having some loss of uh, of your hair on top of your head too. Not always. Um, so that's where I would start looking from a metabolic standpoint. Okay. All right. Uh, the way to look at iron is to do a blood test called ferritin. Ferritin is the storage form of iron and um, uh, ferritin can give you a good idea what's happening. Okay. All right. Good luck to you, TJ. Hello, Anna. Hold on here just a minute. Hello, Marty. Let's see. Would you please interpret the results of head MRI unenhanced in relation to um, MSIDS? Brain parechyma, no acute infection. Mass effector herniation, or, or I'm sorry, no include infarct, uh, mass effector herniation, minimal background, white matter, chronic small vessel disease. Is the diagnosis indicative of Lyme? Does white matter signals improve with treatment? Would an enhanced MRI yield some more information? Thank you very much for the webinar. So um, these, fine, let me just read this through again here. This uh, th this is um, an average MRI that, that healthy people might even have as well, too. There's nothing on the MRI findings here that tell me to think of Lyme. They they're not describing a demyelinating illness, okay? And they would use those words. They would say uh, consistent with a demyelinated, demyelinating lo nerves losing their cover illness. So there isn't anything here that says uh, Lyme to me. There's no architectural changes that say Lyme to me. Now, sometimes Lyme can lead to changes of the architecture by having the myelin, the covering of the nerves, lose their covering. And that would show up on an MRI, even an unenhanced MRI would show up. Um, another way to look at um, 
Lyme and uh, the uh, the kind of uh, blood flow changes that some people might have with Lyme. Oh gosh, I'm gonna blank on the other X-ray to do. <laughs> It'll come to me. I'll, I'll try to I'll try to tell you what it is later. But it's not an MRI. It's not um, an MRI. All right. Um, oh boy, what is that? I'm blanking on it right now. I'm sorry about that, Anna. All right. Hopefully, it comes back to me here, though. Okay. Good luck to you. Thanks for that question. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Marty. I stopped my herbal treatment for Lyme and Bartonell for a few months, and my joint pain was stable. It never got worse off of treatment. When I restarted herbs, my joints began to hurt again. Do you think this diagnostic that Lyme or Bartonella infection is still active? I would have thought joint pain would have gotten worse off treatment if that was the case. So felt confused by this. Any thoughts or insights? Thanks so much for all you do. So I, I don't know for sure what's happening. I'll, I'll make some observations for you to consider. Um, typically, when um, we stop a treatment and Lyme or Bartonella are still active, there's a different timeline at which people will start getting symptomatic. Typically with Bartonella, within about three to four weeks, uh, symptoms will start to return, okay? And that is because Bartonella replicates much more quickly than Lyme, therefore grows back more quickly if it's still present. And that is so about three to four weeks, okay? Lyme, on the other hand, when it's still present, Often you won't see a return to symptoms for two months, three months, maybe four months, all right? So it may be that you still have had some Lyme infection there that when you went back on the herbal antibiotics, you started killing Lyme and you triggered a Herx reaction within the joints, basically. Um, that's possible, all right? And so um, I, I obviously I don't know enough about what your other symptoms are to tell whether I think Lyme is still present or not, but reacting uh, with a, a killer in the joints um, and uh, didn't have any worsening of your knee joints until you did that makes me wonder more Lyme actually because of the timeline that I was just describing. Okay, all right. Good luck to you, Sarah. Hello, Joanne. Let's see. My son had a huge Lyme relapse after doing so well on all your supplements. Thank you for that help. His neurologist wants to do a spinal tap to test for active Lyme inflammation. Thoughts? So, um, so again, look at yeast as a possibility. Okay, again, I'll say that 80 to 90% of relapses, declines have some yeast foundation behind it. Okay, so I've said that earlier tonight. I won't beat a dead horse here, but um, consider that. Okay, and you can even see neurologic symptoms get worse. And I think it's because some of the toxins from yeast are neurotoxic as well, too. All right. All right. Having said that, spinal taps in Lyme. Um, so first of all, if you do a Lyme test, they're going to, they're probably, or if they do a spinal tap, they're probably going to do a Lyme test on the spinal fluid. And what I'll let you know is testing spinal fluid when somebody has active Lyme will only find it about 50% of the time, all right? Now, they may also, though, be able to see other signs of inflammation within the spinal fluid, and um, which could, which would be nonspecific. If there's inflammation, that doesn't mean Lyme is causing it. But if you have inflammatory changes within the spinal fluid, then that can be another clue that maybe Lyme is there, okay? Um, but keep in mind, testing will not find, testing for the Lyme germ, actually, uh, will miss it about 50% of the time, all right? All right. Uh, good luck to your son, jo um, Joanne. Hello, Mosby. Can you tell us about the form you are starting? What is the cost? So what Mosby is referring to is I am uh, currently developing a um, community group 
uh, for people living with Lyme, not for providers, but for people living with Lyme. Eventually, I'm going to set one up for providers to help them too. Uh, the community group, the name, I'm, my working name for it is called Lyme People, a community powering um, health. Okay. All right. Or, a, yeah, a community powering health. So, and what I'm envisioning happening within it right now is I'm going to start small with two main areas that uh, people can interact. One of those areas is going to be an area where I'll probably have twice a week office hours with me where people can ask me questions. The other area is going to be a um, area where people living with Lyme can talk with each other and do problem solving and try to come up with solutions to what's happening. I will also periodically comment in that forum, but the main drivers of that discussion, I want to be people living with Lyme. Um, I will be circling in the background to make sure that there aren't any unsafe ideas being proposed, but I want people to support each other and do some problem solving there, okay? Um, and so I'm currently in the process of developing that. I'm looking, I'm hoping for a June to July launch, uh, but I've got a lot of work to still do, um, but we're getting there. Um, anyhow, I haven't decided what the cost is going to be yet. I am going to wind up charging for it. There'll be a monthly membership fee. And the reason I need to charge for it is I have to pay for the, the forum I'm doing it on. I'm doing it on something called Circle. And it's going to take a substantial amount of my time. Um, and I'm also going to be having a community uh, coordinator working with me as well, too, um, Christine, who happens to help me run my storage. Great customer service. And she's going to be helping me uh, run this as a community uh, manager as well, too. So I've got staffing I got to pay for to do this. OK, so, yes, I am going to be charging. I haven't figured out exactly what that's going to be yet. Um, I know that that will be an obstacle to many people, uh, I hope. But I think you'll get value out of it. And so I'm still trying to decide what that price is going to be. OK, so I can't say yet, Mosby. Um, I likely as I get nearer launching this, I'm probably going to do um, uh, uh, invite um, and have people fill out an application to be the first group of people. And my first group may only be about 10 or 20 people. I'm going to start small and try to figure out the kinks in it and have a starting group so that when I open it up for more uh, general involvement, uh, we'll have worked through some of the problems that can happen when you launch something new. OK, so anyhow, uh, but I'm looking at June, July. Um, I want to make sure that I have things right before we launch, though. OK, all right. Thanks for that question, Mosby. Hello, Doug. This is Dr. Ross. Let's see. I've been treating for mycotoxins with my FMD, who's not expert in Lyme. I have been diagnosed with Lyme and probably Bartonella by another doctor who is an LMD. Oh, your family medical doctor. Okay. An FMD is a family medical doctor. Um, by another doctor who is a Lyme medical doctor. However, the LMD does not want to treat Lyme or start or, or BART unless I stop treatment for mycotoxins. The reason is the inability to determine whether Lyme treatment is working and when treating the two toxins at once, especially because symptoms overlap. How do you treat both at once and know what progress your patients are making on each? Can Lyme treatment be effective unless I first make headway on mycotoxins? I've heard varying practices on these questions. I've tested positive for these toxins on a reliable test. My symptoms are fatigue, leg weakness, insomnia, anxiety, head and sinus pressure, numbness, tingling and pain in the soles of my feet, redness in my legs when standing, redness in my feet when exposed to water or uh, warm or hot water, weight loss, stuffy sinuses, inflammation in my neck and shoulders, and a few others. Okay, so good question. And I think um, uh, different doctors that treat mold toxicity and Lyme together will, will answer it differently. Okay, so my approach is... Um, I think you can treat Lyme and co-infections along with your mold toxicity at the same time. I do make an exception on that though. And that is if I take a history from a patient and it is clear from the questions I asked them that they were handling their Lyme well, they weren't sick, their immune system seemed to have it under control. 
and they didn't get sick until they had a big mold exposure where it's an obvious mold exposure. So they would say, yeah, you know, I got bit by tech five years ago and then I was doing pretty well. And, and then I moved into this house and, and there was black mold on the wall and that's when I got sick. <laughs> I mean, it literally can be that obvious if you ask the question and I do, I try to ask those questions. I'm trying to figure out what is causing this mess in you? Because keep in mind, Lyme symptoms and Lyme disease symptoms, co-infection symptoms, and um, mold toxicity can look the same because ultimately they all trigger too many cytokines, right? And I, I mentioned cytokines earlier tonight, okay? So there are situations where it is clear to me that a person got sick mainly because of mold exposure. I'm going to go after the mold toxins first. And I've got a number of stories I can give you where I spent three months to six months putting people on binders. And when we got their mold toxicity cleaned up, just using binders, not even using any mold killers, just using binders, um, all of the symptoms they had that could look like Lyme went away. Okay, I've got numbers of stories where I can tell you that, okay? Now, it's not always clear what came first though, all right? And so in those situations where it's not clear, I will treat for both at the same time. Now, the question is you can't just use your symptoms then to know if the mold treatment or the Lyme treatment is working. What you can do is repeat your urine mycotoxin test and see, are they getting better, all right? And if they are getting better and yet you're still not having improvement overall on your symptoms, then you've got to think a uh, possibility of that, yeah, that there is Lyme is still driving things, okay? So I will use binders and I will use antibiotics, herbal or prescription at the same time. I have, that's my practice. I have no problem doing that. The way you know if the mold toxicity treatment is working is about every four to six months, you repeat your real time urine study or you repeat your uh, Great Plains. I guess they've come up with a different name now. They're no longer calling themselves Great Plains, but you just go back and retest, okay? And if they're getting better, great. If they're not getting better with mold toxicity, and you're not feeling any better, then you have to wonder, is it all Lyme and or is your multoxicity treatment working? Okay, so if you're not getting better and your multoxin levels aren't coming down, it could mean that you still have ongoing exposure in your home, all right, or your work environment, so you're still getting poisoned basically, okay? Or you have to consider, are you colonized? Um, do you have mold spores that you breathed in in this environment that are now living in your sinuses or your intestines producing toxins, okay? So if I'm about six months into treatment, my mold toxin levels are not getting better, even if somebody's being treated for Lyme and co-infections at the same time, then I'm gonna start thinking about adding in some uh, mold uh, spore killers, um, all right? And those would be things like um, you could do an amphotericin nose spray, you can do a nystatin nose spray, um, you could do amphotericin pills, you could do itraconazole pills uh, to get at the intestinal stuff. Okay. All right. So, and yeah, those are some thoughts for you. Um, good luck to you, Doug. Hello, Nancy. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks for all you do. I have consulted with you previously about BART, but that seems to be resolved. Fantastic. Good. I still have an issue with high values on the uh, Great Plains Lab mycotoxin testing, which I've done since 2018. My aflatoxins are 12, should be below 5. My ochratoxins are 74, should, should be below 7.5. And my mycophenolic acid levels are 1,140, should be below 37. In fact, only 10 weeks ago, my mycophenolic acid levels went up 774 points from the prior test results of 366. I uh, take two mycopoles every day. I do an infrared sauna twice a week, but never the night before the Great Plain Lab test, so I don't skew the results. My doc is thinking maybe I'm colonized and wants me to start nystatin, colloidal silver drops, biocidin, calcium deglucuronate, uh, up my copole to three pills. I take a ton of other supplements. I have no real symptoms of mold toxicity other than maybe a little afternoon fatigue. If I had to come up with something, question number one, 
But starting Nystatin to wake up sleeping Bartonella since I know you like. All right, so let's see here, Nancy. I think there may be more to your question. I'm just trying to see if it got posted. Here we are. Continued, would Nystatin wake up sleeping Bart also? Do I need the colloidal silver if I have no nasal symptoms? What would you do with me? Thank you. All right. So Nancy, this is just what I was talking about with the last question. So if your toxin levels are not dropping, you have to consider, are you still being poisoned from your environment? So um, if you have not done it, I would make sure that you've gotten a good quality um, home study to see if you have mold toxins growing somewhere in that in the environment. Okay. If you're still in a mold toxin environment, it's really hard to get well from this thing. Okay. And number two, I would consider um, using something to kill mold toxins. Now, Nystatin, if he's going to do it in a pill form, is only going to start getting at some of the mold colonization in the intestines. It's not going to do anything up here. Um, uh, silver drops may get at some of the intestinal stuff. I wouldn't call it a strong one. I will use colloidal silver nose spray sometimes to go up in the nose. Will any of these actually... Um, Wake up Bartonella, no, they're, they're not gonna have effect on Bartonella, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Nancy. Hello, Brianne, thank you for your help. I have a question about Bartonella. Some say it's the most difficult to treat, yet I've heard it only takes four to six months. How accurate is that? Also, struggling to take anything to treat severe Herx reaction to herbs and antibiotics. I have mold. Is it possible I'm too toxic to start treating? Um, so, you know, for the majority of people, Bartonella is four to six months. There is probably about a 15% group that it becomes a very chronic, difficult to get rid of problem that can sometimes takes one to two years. Okay. So I would say both things are true. Okay. But for the majority of people, uh, four to six months is going to be enough to clear your Bartonella. How accurate is he? So, any, and then um, terms of herbs and antibiotics and RA2 toxic, I, I can't tell from what you wrote here. Um, I can't answer whether you're too toxic and how you should stage things. I don't know enough of your history here to give you a, a decent answer on that, okay? Uh, what I can tell you is there are some things you can use to help control that quote unquote toxic feeling and herxing, okay? So keep in mind when people say I feel toxic, what they mean is they feel like crap, okay? They're achy, fatigued, they feel foggy in the brain. All of those symptoms are due to too many cytokines. And as I've mentioned here earlier tonight, Lyme, and co-infections will trigger too many cytokines and mold toxicity can trigger too many cytokines and killing your germs can trigger too many cytokines and pulling toxins out of you can trigger too many cytokines, all right? So at a minimum, what I like to do for people in this kind of situation is I like to have them take uh, curcumin, a liposomal form of curcumin. Uh, curcumin is a component of the seasoning turmeric and it does a good job of getting inside white blood cells and uh, blocking the production pathways for cytokines, okay? So it can help lower the cytokines. 500 milligrams three times a day. The product I like using for it, because it appears to me to have good absorption, is a product by Thorne called curcumin phytosome, okay? In addition, I like to have people on uh, liposomal glutathione, that product I mentioned earlier tonight is a product called Trifortify by Research Nutritionals. The reason I go for the liposomal um, product or the glutathione is twofold. Glutathione is used by the liver to help pull toxins out. Okay, so if there is a component of toxicity driving your cytokines, it will help the liver get rid of them. Okay, number one. Number two, it's a very, glutathione is a very strong antioxidant. And as an antioxidant, it lowers oxidizing agents that trigger your white blood cells to make cytokines, okay? So you can kind of think of curcumin as being inside the white blood cells, blocking production, 
and glutathione is outside the white blood cells trying to block the oxidizing agent signals that tell the white blood cells to make cytokines. So you get a double effect. And in addition to glutathione uh, can help with uh, some of the, uh, the toxicity issues that you talk about as well too, okay? So um, the way to do the glutathione in situations where people are really having a hard time is you do a teaspoon twice a day on that, okay? And again, the uh, curcumin, the product you like for that is thorn uh, curcumin phytosome, and that's a 500 milligram pill um, three times a day. Sometimes you can even double it up to two pills three times a day if, if it's not helpful at the lower dose, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you. Let me do a screen share so you can get some more information about what I just said here too, Brianne. So take a look at, um, All right, so all right, so this is back at my Lyme disease information site. And then take a look at this section called Herxheimer and cytokines. And then um, take a look at this article called Control Cytokines, a guide to fix Lyme symptoms and the immune system, okay? I talk about the various steps you can take to get cytokines under control, all right? All right. Thanks for your question. Let me see here. I've got a very loudly snoring Basinji going on <laughs> back there. I don't know if you guys can see her. Let me see. No, she's down on the floor. So um, let me see. I move my camera here. Yeah, there she is. That's Halo back there, right there. And she is a loud snorer. <laughs> she, I may have to go wake her up to get her to stop. <laughs> and for those of you that are wondering, yeah, there's her brother Thor. And that is Thor right there. So they uh, both camp out with me here um, as I'm working during my webinars and also as I'm working during the day. And the, the last week or so, I've been, again, I've been focused on uh, taking the steps to try to get my uh, community launched and, and all the things I have to build to do that. So, yeah. Anyhow, let's see here. Hello, Mary. I just finished four months of Difucan plus Nystatin and am continuing treatment for Lyme and Bartonella plus Babesia. Would 100 or 2 milligrams of Difucan two times per week plus Nystatin daily keep yeast at bay while continuing antibiotics? So, you know, my approach is uh, to use, uh, unless I've got somebody that's had a lot of yeast difficulties, Usually what I will do is after we get them cleaned up, as you have with the Diflucan and Nystatin, then I'm going to use just Nystatin alone to help sweat down some of those yeast. And then I will also use um, probiotics uh, to, to populate the intestines, okay? And I'll try to limit simple sugars, uh, cookie, candy, cake, ice cream, the obvious stuff, all right? Those are the basic steps I do. The Nystatin I would use would be, um, uh, I would do... Um, two pills uh, twice a day, or if you get the liquid, it would be a 10 milliliters, which is two teaspoons twice a day. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Mary. Hello, Margo. Question regarding Lyme Bartonella protocol. Um, Good evening to Dr. Ross. Thank you for these weekly informative and helpful web webcasts. You're welcome. Let's see. One, regarding the herb Sidokudahutania, do either help eradicate Lyme? Two, what herbs fight fatigue? And three, does your earthworm supplement help kill Lyme and Bartonella? Which herbs fight daily fatigue due to insomnia? Thank you, Marco. All right. So number one, Siddha Akuda Hutania, again, those are two herbs um, that I like to use to treat Bartonella, um, where I got the idea to use them is from Buner as in Buner herbs, okay? Siddha Akuda has some Lyme, anti-Lyme activity, but I don't find it to be the strongest. But to answer your question, it may help with Lyme, but I would never build a treatment around it, 
Okay, you may get some help, but I wouldn't build a treatment around it. Um, two, what herbs fight fatigue? So fatigue has a lot of components to it. Okay, so number one, if you've got insomnia, you need uh, you need to try to take steps to try to get seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Okay, and so um, um, there's herbal options you can use. There are prescription options, but whatever it takes. You've got to try to get seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you in a second my uh, treatment protocol because I list in the treatment protocol some starting steps you can take to knock yourself out to get sleep. Okay, the second thing that my protocol does is it says lower cytokines. If you lower cytokines, cytokines can give you fatigue, and if you lower them using a curcumin phytosome, that can sometimes make a difference too. Okay, third thing that can help with the low energy that often you have in Lyme as you're trying to get things under control is to work to support your adrenal glands and your thyroid. And the herb that I like to use that, and again, it's mentioned in my protocol, is an herb called ashwagandha. Ashwagandha comes to us out of Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine. It's been used for thousands of years in those cultures because it's been observed to give people energy when they're under stress, okay? We know from animal models and animal studies that both the adrenal glands and the thyroid work better when a person is using ashwagandha. So I use, I recommend a product by Organic India, and that is, um, is a 400 milligram pill. But if you use other products, sometimes they come as 500 milligram pills. But you want to take anywhere from 400 to 500 milligram pill and do two of those in the morning and two of those between one and two as a means of supporting your adrenals and thyroid. Okay, all right. So get sleep, uh, lower cytokines, uh, try, to, try the ashwagandha, okay? All right. The other thing is make sure you don't have too many yeast sitting there because if they are, they're kicking up cytokines and that can be an easy thing to fix within a month and you start getting energy back from that as well too. If you have low energy also, your provider should have done some testing to see if you have good adrenal function and good thyroid function. And sometimes there's medications you need to help correct that as well too, okay? All right, so those are my basic steps to helping with low energy. Now, if, um, if I'm about six months or nine months into a Lyme disease treatment and energy is not budging, then I wanna take steps to start supporting and repairing the cell energy factories, which are called mitochondria, all right? And I mentioned that earlier tonight, but to do that, you want to use glutathione, a teaspoon a day, and ATP 360 um, or NT factor. Again, the ATP 360 would be three pills one time a day. You can use it if you're not using a tobacone or something with a tobacone in it to manage Babesia. Um, and if you are, then you would do the NT factor, and that's two pills um, three times a day. Now, I talked about more about that earlier tonight, okay? All right, let's see. In terms of which herbs fight daily fatigue due to insomnia, well, you want to get sleep, all right? So there's um, sleep options that you could do herbally. One would be to do L-theanine. It's a 100 milligram pill, and uh, you can take up to six of those at nighttime. Uh, L-theanine leads to increased levels of GABA in the brain, and if you give more uh, GABA to GABA receptors in the brain, that can sedate you, okay? There also are herbal combinations, and I have one called the sleep formula that I recommend that have a variety of different herbal ingredients in them that can help with sleep. Some herbal ingredients that can be in a sleep compound could be 5-HTP, L-theanine, uh, hops, yams, um, wild lettuce. Um, there's a whole host of things. Passion flower sometimes can be part of those too. Okay, uh, let me do, I'm going to do a quick screen share here and give you some ideas to start with though. All right, so, okay, so my Lyme protocol is here, and it's the Ross Lyme support protocol. And the first uh, step in here is get sleep, okay? And so the supplements I recommend uh, for that, again, is either the L-theanine, I just talked with you about that, or an herbal uh, sleep combination uh, so, for instance, um, sleep and, and some of the, the what you would find in sleep for me, but like valerian root, lemon balm, passion flower, hops, yams, wild lettuce, L-theanine. Okay. All right. 
uh, or you could do prescription medicines. I list some options here. Um, uh, you want to lower cytokines. I, I did mention that earlier. I talk about it here. You want to be on the uh, ashwagandha as an adaptogen. Again, you want to look at your hormone levels. Uh, yeah, be on a good multivitamin. I should have mentioned that earlier. And I give you some ideas of what I consider good ones here. And then um, if you have yeast, deal with that as well too. Okay, all right. And then uh, I did say... Um, I have this section called additional supports and treatments. Okay. So um, I do talk about um, energy and fatigue and ways to fix the mitochondria here. All right. And uh, anyhow, so, so that gives you the background that you need here. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks for a question, Margo. Questions, I should say. Good luck to you. Hello, Tice. Let's see. Hey, Dr. Ross. Thank you for your website. It contains very useful information for newcomers like me. Here's a few questions for you. Can you build resistance to methylene blue monotherapy? Two. How does LDN and methylene blue fare together with the Buner protocol regarding interactions? And three, what are your observations along COVID patients with reactivated Lyme and co-infections? All right, so number one, um, you know, I don't, in terms of methylene blue resistance as monotherapy, um, I would. I don't use methylene blue as monotherapy. I don't think by itself it, it's going to be enough. We find the most successful treatments at Lyme or Bartonella are going to also involve another agent as well. Okay. All right. Um, in theory, though, methylene blue is probably going to have a hard time uh, getting resistance. Um, one of the mechanisms that we think it works by is it has a means of destabilizing the covering of the germ. And that probably is not going to be susceptible to resistance developing uh, by the bacteria. Okay. So I don't think we're going to see resistance the longer we use methylene blue um, develop here. Number two, how does LDN methylene blue fare together with the Buner herb? You know, I, I use LDN and methylene blue with herbs that you might find in a Buner protocol. And I find no interaction problems that I've, I've seen in my practice. And I find people tolerate those uh, well. Okay. So I don't see a problem with that. And number three, what are your observations on long COVID patients with reactivated Lyme and co-infections? So, um, you know, the thing, my approach would be is definitely try to treat Lyme and co-infections or you go back and start treating them again and um, you can get them under control. Um, so it, it, I don't think that having long COVID, it may reactivate, but I don't think it makes it any harder to get those germs under control. At least that's what my observation has been. Okay, all right. Uh, good luck to you, Tice. Hello, Erica. Let's see. Do you feel that C3A is a good measure of inflammation? What is the difference between C3 blood tests and C3A blood tests? Are they comparable? My 11-year-old with pans from Lyme, BART, and Babesia had her C3 tested a year ago at the beginning of treatment. It was very elevated. Her symptoms have improved though not in remission and on a very aggressive IV antibiotic protocol. After 1.5 years of treatment and her C3A was recently tested and it was on the low side of the normal range. Are these results indicative of lowered inflammation and in line with the improvements that we are seeing? All right, so, so C3 and C3A are not interchangeable, okay? So um, C stands for complement and this is complement type three, and there's the whole complement, and then there's C3A, which I believe is a part of the, the, the C3. Um, 
these are complements are another way that the immune system uses to fight infections, okay? Where C3A and C4A are often measured, something called C4A, complement type 4A, is as part of uh, Richie Shoemaker, Dr. Shoemaker has um, an approach to evaluating for people for something he calls chronic inflammatory response syndrome, which is initially initiated by chronic yeast. And in his theory, that can set up inflammation that takes on a life of its own, okay? And he measures a number of inflammatory markers called C3A, C4A, um, VIP, TGF beta one. There, there's a whole host of things that he measures in his protocol. The trouble is, although they may be accurate indicators when somebody has mold toxicity, if you throw Lyme in the mix and infections in the mix, a lot of those indicators lose their relevance in terms of whether it's yeast triggering them or infections triggering them because they both can do it. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, not yeast, I'm uh, mold toxins or uh, Lyme and co-infections triggering them. Regarding C3A, C3A um, can be elevated in acute Lyme, but not in chronic Lyme. And because your C3A was not tested initially, I have no idea what it means now that it's lower because I don't have anything to compare it to. Okay, you can't compare it to a C3. They're, they're technically different things, all right? Um, I, I would, I don't know, I would, I don't know if they're totally indicative of, of decreased inflammation again, because I don't know what the initial C3A was. Okay. All right. Um, good luck to you. Hello, Heather. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I've been on 0.25 milligrams of LDN for two years. It has helped my pain. And every time I try to increase the dose, my anxiety skyrockets. What do you think is going on? I keep taking it because it helps my allergies, but I'd like to help my pain. Thanks. Um, there is a small group of people that cannot tolerate LDN because it can trigger psychiatric and psych issues. It's just a small subset. Why it happens, I don't know, all right? Um, I don't know what the mechanism is behind that. Um, you might, uh, so, and, and yeah, so anyhow, I'm sorry, I don't have a good solution for you here. You might also want to take a look at doing peptide therapy instead, and something that can be very helpful at, um, stabilizing uh, mast cells and getting inflammation under control and pain under control is a peptide called BPC-157. Um, that would be a pill twice a day. Or another option you could look at is a peptide called um, KPV. KPV is probably stronger at stabilizing the mast cells and allergies, but it can also lower some of the inflammation as well too, okay? Uh, let me show you an article that I've written on, on both of those, all right? All right, so take a look. I'm just going to type it in here. So I'm going to put in peptides. Uh, so here's my article. It's called Key Oral Peptide Strategies to Repair and Restore and Lyme and Mold Toxicity. I would take a look at the information I have here on BPC-157. I would also take a look at the information that I have here on KPV, okay? And then down here, I talk about a strategy you can use to employ these various peptides. Um, uh, and if you are looking for those peptides, the company that I use that makes them in an oral form is called Integrative Peptides, and you can find those at my supplement store as well, too. Okay. All right. A good luck to you, Heather. Let's see. 
got some repeat questions here that I'm just trying to clean out before I post them. Hello, Crystal. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much for your time and offering these webinars, especially after I was just told by my Lyme doctor, sorry, Lyme disease is a rich person's disease. <laughs> Boy, I have Lyme and three strains of Bartonella, of which uh, Bartonella is the most distressful. I just got my pick line out yesterday. I was on two rounds. First was doxy and azithromycin IV. Second was metronidazole and ceftriaxone IV. Igenix testing showed no improvement. I'll remain IgM positive. Do these courses cover both Lyme and Bartonella? I'm lost on the next step in treatment given no improvement in severe cognitive impairment. All right. So um, I, I, I know some of my colleagues repeat the um, Igenix testing of uh, antibody levels and they think that there is something meaningful that happens when you see lower levels. And um, I disagree. We, we don't have any testing that we can do that tells you whether you're getting better. We just don't. Uh, when you look at uh, Igenix testing, like the immunoblot that they offer, that's measuring uh, the degree of antibody response that you have. All right. Now, the antibody response that you have, the strength of it can be influenced by a number of things. Number one, the germ load, okay? But also if you have a lot of germ activity, that those germs can suppress the immune system, causing you to have lower antibody levels, all right? So if some doctors think magically that, oh, I've got lower antibodies, I must be treating somebody well, that doesn't mean anything. It just means that, they're not making as many antibodies, which could be because your treatment's failing and the germs are more active, all right? So it's not a reliable indicator to go ahead and do that. Unfortunately, I know doctors do this. They want, they want to have some something validating that what they do is right. They rely on testing, but testing to repeat testing is not an accurate way of knowing where you are. I, I just disagree with my colleagues that are doing that. Um, in terms of your treatment, the doxy azithromycin would be a good combination for Bartonella, and it would have treated for um, spirochete and uh, intracellular Lyme. So Lyme can exist in different form uh, appearances. Okay, so there's a corkscrew looking thing that looks like a, a snake. We call that the spirochete. And then Lyme also can live inside of cells. It loses its covering, and we call that intracellular Lyme or L-form Lyme. And the doxy and azithromycin both can handle that. What you were not on during that time period, though, is anything that would go for another form of the germ, which is called the cyst form. Now, some of my colleagues think that you can let those cysts build up and that you come in and sweat them down later. Okay. All right. And so your second month, that metronidazole would be something useful to treat the cyst, the ceftriaxone would have been something useful to treat uh, the spirochete by knocking holes in the covering of the spirochete, maybe picks up cyst a little bit, and the metronidazole might do some intracellular Lyme as well too, okay? But I would not say that that second month you are on anything meaningful for Bartonella, all right? Um, so I, I'm not quite sure what your, my critique is I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure what your provider is, um, what, what their thinking is behind this approach, all right? I can't say they're wrong. I'm just not sure what their thinking is behind it. I wouldn't approach it this way, all right? Um, keep in mind also, I don't care whether you're on IV antibiotics uh, versus oral antibiotics. It takes time to get better. If we look at studies that were done regarding the Lyme germ, these were unpublished studies from a number of years ago, it can, by three months of treatment, about 30% of people start having improvement for the Lyme infection, okay? By six months of treatment, 60% of people start having improvement. And by nine months, 90% start having improvement, okay? So it can take time to see any changes on Lyme, okay? For Bartonella, if you're on something that's working, usually by two months of using it, you'll start to see some improvements. The trouble is your treatment was changed after a month, so you have no idea whether this was gonna be the right combination for you or not, all right? so. Anyhow, I, I, I can't say I'm in full agreement with the approach that your provider used. I don't understand what rationale they were using. Maybe they have a reasonable idea as to why they're doing this. All right. So that's my critique on it.
of a game. But I would I would talk to them and see if what they're going to do that's going to design a treatment that's going to treat all of your infections at the same time because they can. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Crystal. Hello, Ms. E. Greetings, blessings, and love to all. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very nice greeting tonight. Thanks. Hello, Jan. Let's see. Thank you for your time and commitment to this community. Why are Lyme patients told to take it very slow in regards to cardio and other physical activities? Thanks again. Um, so generally, I, my, my rule of thumb and the way I approach my patients with exercise is to find a level you can do that doesn't knock you down. All right. If you consistently do a level of activity that causes you to pay the price with more fatigue or more body pain the next day, that's too much. And it's probably going to interfere with your progress and getting well. You could get to a point you actually uh, cause injury or immune suppression by overdoing it. So my rule of thumb is find an exercise you like. It could even be cardio, but you have to find a level that doesn't make you worse. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question, Jen. Good luck to you. Hi, Char. Can chronic Lyme produce symptoms of pelvic pain? Uh, yeah, it can. Um, but before declaring that it's due to Lyme, you also should be working with somebody that's done a good pelvic exam and try to figure out if there's other reasons you might be having that pelvic pain, like uh, cyst on your uh, ovaries, for instance, or uh, problems with your uterus, all right? maybe problems with your bladder, but there should be an evaluation before we just say it happens to be from Lyme. We want to make sure there isn't other causes of that. Okay. Good luck to you. Hello, Susan. Let's see. Can you discuss carditis with Lyme and Bartonella? So there's not much to discuss. I mean, it's, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to um, sound harsh with that, but both Lyme and Bartonella can lead to carditis, which means inflammation of the heart muscle. Okay, both of them can do that. Um, usually treating the infection with herbal or prescription antibiotics will get that under control. Okay, that's about all I can really say about it. So, um, but yeah, they both can. Okay. Um, good luck to you, Susan. Hello, Katie. Dr. Marty Ross. Doctors can't figure out what is wrong with me. Eight weeks of swollen glands and a goiter, but normal ultrasound of thyroid and normal blood work, burning esophagus and back of throat tight throat, uncomfortable to swallow, feels like maybe nerve damage in the back of my throat, glands and blood vessels feel inflamed in my neck. I'm very uncomfortable. I was treated for H. pylori uh, one month ago, no improvement. I have Lyme, Bart, and Babesia and been treating the infections hard the past five weeks. Do you know what can cause this? Um, so, I mean, it sounds like they're, they're trying to evaluate. Number one, I, I, I like that they did the ultrasound to see is the thyroid really swollen on, on that, and that came back normal. So that probably means you don't have goiter. Goiter means swollen thyroid. That would have been picked up on the ultrasound. Bartonella can give you a lot of swollen glands. Bartonella can cause uh, nerve dysfunction and even give you nerve pain of burning. Maybe this is part of Bartonella. If you're having a lot of pain on swallowing though, um, and in your food pipe, I would want to have a specialist look down and see, are they seeing signs of esophagitis, meaning inflammation? Are they seeing inflammation in your stomach? Keep in mind, you can get inflammation of your food pipe if you have acid refluxing from the stomach up into your food pipe. 
in which case they want to do things to lower acid levels. So that's not happening. Okay. Um, could this be all manifestations of Lyme and Bartonella? Maybe. Um, but I also, if you, if you were my patient and described something like this, I would probably get, want to have my um, uh, GI specialist take a look down your food pipe and look down into the stomach and see what's going on down there too. Okay. All right. And keep in mind, if, if this is all Lyme, five weeks is not long enough. As I mentioned earlier tonight, uh, for Bartonella, it can sometimes take four to six weeks. For Babesia, it can sometimes take, um, I'm sorry, for Bartonella, it can take a minimum of about two months sometimes before you start seeing improvements. For Babesia, the same thing, up to about two months, even on a good Babesia treatment to see improvements. And for Lyme, and by three months, only 30% of people start having improvements, and by six months, 60% do. So it's too soon to say whether you're treating your Lyme is going to make a difference here or not, okay? All right. Uh, and co-infections, too. Uh, good luck, UK. Hello, Jen. Is it okay to use ATP 360 with uh, phytocidal? Yeah, I, have, I don't see a problem with that. And uh, phytocidal being some kind of an herbal uh, antibiotic, I'm not sure exactly what's in it. Um, if it's phytostan, which is something I use, definitely phytocidal. Um, I, ATP 360, you should be able to use with any kind of herbal uh, antibiotic compound. Okay. All right. Thanks. Good for, good luck to you, Jeff. Let's see. Yeah. There's some that I'm seeing here twice, so just bear with me a minute here. Hello, Michael. Oh, let's see, Anna. Uh, I just thought of the x-ray that would be useful to know if you've got limited blood flow to areas of your brain in a pattern that you might see um, in Lyme disease. That's something called a SPECT scan, okay? Uh, S-P-E-C-T, okay? It's a type of CAT scan where they can actually measure blood flow activity. Um, so anyhow, I told you I would think about it, it would come back. <laughs> it did take me a while to figure that out, but yeah. Hello, Michael. Let's see. In June 2022, I tested positive for acute Lyme disease and underwent treatment with doxycycline for two weeks, followed by three months of alicinin as per Dr. Zang's recommendations. I continue to experience digestive issues such as dysphagia and acid reflux, which I suspect resulted from the alicinin. I also occasionally experience... Uh, joint pain at night, making me wonder if Lyme disease persists. Can Lyme disease directly affect the digestive symptom and liver? Assuming my digestive problems aren't caused by Lyme disease, what are the most effective anti-Lyme herbs that won't harm digestion? I recently um, bought resveratrol and have cat's claw, but haven't tried um, Otoba. I also recently started Megaspore Biotic. Thank you. So I, I, I don't know if I can have the best answer for you here, Michael. The, the one problem you're going to run into is if you've got a lot of um, gastritis or um, also having a lot of uh, inflammation in your food pipe is uh, I tend to use herbal tinctures and all those herbal tinctures are alcohol based, right? So that sometimes can lead to more inflammation and pain within the digestive system. The elicinin can sometimes lead to that indigestion and um, gastritis and esophagitis as well too. One thing I do with my patients when I get in a situation like this is I might have them start taking um, uh, decalizerated licorice. And these are tablets that you chew. When you chew that, your saliva and your spit interact with the licorice and it causes the formation of a gelatinous microscopic coat that coats your food pipe and coats your stomach and can make it so you can tolerate taking some of these herbal tinctures as well too, okay? Uh, the way you usually do that is a couple pills chewed, 
uh, before me before meals or before you take your medications a few times a day um, a product i like that has the deglycerated licorice in it is something called risinate that's r-h-i-z-i-n-a-t-e by integrative therapeutics um, if you're looking for a source you can find that at marty ross md supplements as well too okay all right all right good luck to you michael thanks for our question All right, everyone. Um, that's it. I know I started here a few minutes late, but we went a few minutes over, so I hope I made up for that. Um, so I won't be with you next week, um, as I as I said earlier today, but you will be able to um, sign up tomorrow for the next series of webinars that will begin in May. Okay, we'll do three in a row in May. I enjoyed being with you here tonight. Um, I wish everyone well. Um, and uh, keep your eye out for the email tomorrow morning where you get the email announcing that the video is ready to be seen. It will also have a synopsis of what we talked about tonight um, and a way to sign up for the next series of webinars. Um, help me reach more people. Uh, my goal is to help as many people as possible. Um, if you're getting benefits, and it sounds like a lot of you are, other people will get benefits too. So uh, share my emails, uh, send them out so that people can watch the videos or they can choose to sign up and participate in these webinars in the future as well too. All right, I'd appreciate it. Good night, everyone.